Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our part two of the digital neonatal nursing course. Today, um, after a short summer break, we are reciting with module five of the, uh, and the focus of today's webinar will be on the gastrointestinal uh, tract. Once again, my name is Margarita Singer, and I am the Regional Marketing Manager for Neonatal Care and also the uh, Authorized Trainer for Neonatal Care at Dreyer. And I'm very happy to welcome you all today and to have um, our esteemed guest speaker, Ms. Linda Pretorius, joining us today to share her expertise and her clinical knowledge um, in the area. Um, just a short introduction uh, before we start uh, the webinar. Uh, welcome everyone, and uh, today we're going to be discussing the gastrointestinal tracts. A third informational topic, so we're going to have a lecture from the Cinder um, We're going to have two blocks of the lecture. After the first block, we will open the floor for your questions. And then after the second block, we will um, open the floor again for the questions. If you have any questions, you can type them in, in the question bar and the question box on the right hand side of your GoToWebinar platform. Also, if you would like to refer to the previous recordings of the previous modules, you can find them on our website um, under the link that is shared in the chat box. So please refer to the chat box to find the link to our website where you can find the recordings of the previous webinar. And as I would say, I'm extremely honored to be joined today by Ms. Linda Pretorius, who has a vast experience in the field of neonatal care. She has a bachelor's degree in nursing, and she spent multiple years working in the neonatal care units and in the pediatric intensive care units in the UK. After that, she came back to the, um, South Africa, and uh, she worked on the establishing the right neonatal care practices, especially with the focus on the developmental care and the brain protection. So today, as I said, I'm extremely honored to have Ms. Linda as our speaker. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Linda to start the presentation. So today we'll be covering the gastrointestinal tract. And I think what's very important for us to realize here is that in the discussion today, we are not just only going to do, deal with the anatomy and physiology of the GIT tract, but in actual fact, we're going to cover a fair amount of developmental care um, within this system. Because what we are finding is that more and more babies are, are developing problems post um, discharge from the units and very often it originates in the unit where the problem comes from. Um, let me just see if I can, there we are. So when we talk embryology, um, the gastrointestinal tract arises from the endoderm with some mesoderm involvement. So the endoderm is the part within, there are, are three layers right at the beginning where the fetus originates from. It's the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. From previous lectures, you guys will remember that the ectoderm is where the skeletal system arises from. And then later on, we the mesoderm, meso, M, close to muscle, and endoderm is often most of the organs originate from the endoderm. So the initial growth of the gut is called the primal gut, and it starts in week four and is complete by week 22. However, it's important to note that by week 10, the baby is, there is swallowing motions occurring, and by week 26, the baby is taking as much as 200 mils of lipo or amniotic fluid in a 24-hour period. 
the baby will drink continuously and pass urine as the kidney starts functioning um, in, back into the amniotic fluid. And we will find in the amniotic fluid that there are various gro growth hormones and, and um, a feeding does occur from there. The gut divides into the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. And to also remember that the gut, um, that the gut actually um, arises, that the gut actually is on the midline. So all the, 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 the birth defects that we see arising from the gut generally is called a midline defect. So when we talk about the primal gut, the foregut consists of the pharynx, the lower res respiratory tract, the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, and the pancreas. So the liver and pancreas and the stomach is under the diaphragm. The esophagus goes through the diaphragm, and obviously the pharynx and the lower pharynx is there um, to see. So it's very important that you realize that the gut and the respiratory system can be linked when there are birth defects. The midgut is considered to be the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the appendix, the colon ascending and transverse. And then the hindgut sounds a little bit um, not being the same, but it is considered transverse ascending colon sigmoid, rectum, proximal anal canal are all considered the hindgut. Now, if we start developing problems, we can develop problems in one area, such as the foregut. So your so-called tops sit here, but we could have a problem in the midgut. The so-called double bubble can sit here, or we can have a problem in the hindgut when we are dealing with something like a co-anal atresia. Ugh, an anal atresia, not a co-anal atresia. However, you could have a co-anal atresia situated up here. The midgut rotates into the umbilical cord and by week 10, it is back into the abdomen. This is a very important concept because when we are dealing, and we will in the second half of the lecture discuss this, when we're talking about the so-called exomphalus or the gastroschisis, it is after week 10 where we see that the problems have arisen because it has not rotated back into the abdomen. It is also important to note at the same time that if we do have something, uh, if we do have um, a congenital um, hyperplastic lung, this is the same week where that problem arises from. And that is because the diaphragm does not develop correctly or fully. So when we talk amniotic fluid, in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy, the amniotic fluid acts like a dialyzing fluid and is very similar but lower in protein to the mum and the fetal pl plasma. Dialysis via the amniotic fluid stops in the third trimester and the baby utilizes amniotic fluid in three ways. Firstly, it goes into the gut <clears throat> and it will sit there and ends up becoming meconium as urine and in the respiratory tract, there will be fluid as well. And by 36 weeks, the amniotic fluid is promoting and maintaining rapid cell differentiation. And this is very important because once a baby is born, the amniotic fluid is removed and then that in itself can be problematic. So with fetal development, it's important to remember that the functions can be turned on at gestational age or at birth. So when a baby is born, irrespective of gestational age and the baby is considered viable. The baby can make respiration movements. There can be gaseous exchange. The white matter in the brain turns to gray matter 
and the skin keratinizes and the digestive tract works. So when we look at developmental care, remember that these micro premies, so the 26 weekers to 32 weekers, for this keratinization to happen prior to that, we will nurse them in the hybrid incubator. Gestational age, peristalsis only really starts um, showing up at 27 weeks of age. And the baby will start making sucking, breathing, and swallowing motions um, within the uterus at the same age. And the renal function will slowly improve. So what does the GIT do post-delivery? In utero, the baby swallows, as we said, amniotic all the time. The 30-weeker can take as much as 450 mils a day while the term day baby takes as much as 700 mils a day. And a large volume of this fluid lands up in the gut and becomes meconium. Here it will stimulate the bowel, which in turn will grow the villi. Now, it is very, very important to remember that when these babies are taking this fluid, they are taking it constantly. So if you have a new baby in your unit, and you keep that baby nil per os, you are going to see that the villi will flatten because you've kept the baby nil per os, because there is no amniotic fluid moving through the GIT tract. After birth, the bowel adapts to enteral feeding. It learns to digest, absorb. There's mucosal growth and peristalsis. So one of the big things about colostrum is that it's very, very high in magnesium. And magnesium causes peristalsis. So because the baby is born and it receives colostrum, even if it is a 26-weeker, it will stimulate um, peristalsis and peristalsis grows villi. That is why enteral feeding is becoming more and more and more popular as early as possible. Gut colonization plays a huge role here as your other brain is your gut. There is a very definite link between your gut and your brain. All babies, all preemies suffer from reflux. As the esophageal peristalsis is still immature and bidirectional. And it stays bidirectional because that is why, when you are nauseous, you are able to vomit. Colostrum plays a huge role here. And because the intestinal motor function is immature and disorganized, absorption can be affected. Now, it's very important that we start feeding the babies as soon as we possibly can, as it gives them a greater amount of protection. And um, at the end of this first block, I will discuss what reflux actually looks like and why it is problematic in the neonatal unit. So let's look at the importance of colostrum. According to R.K. Kumar et al., better nutrition, especially in the first week of life of a preterm infant, has shown to ensure a higher IQ, improved cognitive skills in the long term, and in the low birth weight baby, there are far better developmental scores. When we look at better nutrition, we have to consider that the micro preemie or the sick preemie or the sick term infant will need support from both TPN and enteral feeding or breast milk as soon as we possibly can. Colostrum contains both immune comp um, components as well as growth hormone and colostrum stabilizes the blood glucose and allows for the development, the development of lean muscle versus fat depositing. This is a very, very important concept, is that it does stabilize the blood glucose and it also crosses the blood 
brain barrier. Long term, it gives us brain protection. It doesn't protect against the intraventricular hemorrhage. It protects against developmental delay. These superpowers are essential for gut closure as well as maturation of the intestinal walls, further preventing the development of NEC. The, pr the presence of cytokines act as an inflammatory inhibitor in both the gut and the lungs if the baby is fed early. So the colostrum contains cytokines and these are an inflammatory inhibitor, inhibitor which prevents the, inf the inflammation of both gut and lungs long term if the baby is fed early. It is very important to ensure that breast milk is continued where possible in the preemie stage or in the stage that your premature infant is growing in your neonatal unit. Why? Because breast milk for a preemie is made specifically for a preemie and there will be growth hormone excreted from the mother to the baby via the breast milk. So we will see optimal growth of developing organs. Remember that most organs continue developing post delivery, even at term, essential organs. And therefore, the more breast milk we can get in, the better for the baby to grow. By feeding colostrum orally in the buccal cavities and your buccal cavities sit on either side or is or in your cheeks. So that it's the actual inside of your cheek. That's the buccal cavity. The colostrum is absorbed there by the lymphoid tissue and immediately goes to work. The minute you feed a bit of colostrum orally, and even if a mother brings you 0.2 of a mil of colostrum, that can be put into the baby's mouth and it will start colonizing that baby's gut from the tip of his tongue down to into the, into the rest of the gut. And as nurses, this is often where we make our mistakes. We, we do not buckle feed. So what happens is that the mouth, the back of the throat, right down into the esophagus, starts colonizing with hospital-acquired buds. Why? because we are putting all sorts of instruments or um, tubes down the baby's nose or mouth. So we're putting in a new nasogastric tube, we're suctioning that baby. Every one of those opportunities gives the baby a chance to actually colonize with a hospital acquired bug or a different bug to that that would be in the colostrum. So it is advised to feed buccally, to put a tiny bit of milk, 0.1 and 0.1 mil of a mil of, of colostrum in the baby's buccal area. It will be absorbed there and it will give the baby better cover. As I said, colostrum is, is very high in magnesium, which ensures the correct gut motility, which means that the gut, so from the jejunum onwards that the peristaltic movement is towards the anal area. So it gives good gut motility and it helps with peristalsis. Colostrum crosses the blood-brain barrier and helps mature the brain as I have said before. When we talk about colonizing the gut, we are here now starting to talk about polynucleides and these are added by various people in formulas but they do not do the same work as breast milk will. So colostrum in breast milk is not just a feed, it acts like an antibiotic and it's a signaler because there's growth hormone in there so it signals further growth of organs. Most mammals cannot survive without colostrum. In actual fact the only mammal that can survive without colostrum happens to be the human. Puppies and kittens who receive no colostrum have a very, very high incidence of death. They present 
quite early on later in life. So um, in, in what is termed the animal's mid years with things like renal failure, gut failure. And this is because they haven't received colostrum. And in actual fact, if a calf doesn't receive colostrum, he'll end up on the plate. So colostrum is high in epithelial growth factor, which helps prevent NEC. This, this has been now proven by blocking a harmful by blocking a harmful protein which can damage the sterile bowel. Colostrum stabilizes blood glucose levels, as we said. It allows for mean muscle weight gain, which is far better, because remember that your micropreni and your preni are at risk of organ fat development. By feeding breast milk, you prevent organ fat, um, you prevent organ fat development. But organs that have got fat around them are not healthy organs. And what, what has been shown in various studies is that if a baby is scanned on um, discharge, a, a micropremi especially, but a, a young brem as well, they can already show organ fat. And we all know that long-term organ fat and, and um, abdominal fat, big guts, ha have, are problematic for you in your middle age. And that is why many of our preemies are presenting with early hypert um, hypertension as 20 and 30 year olds, as well as type 2 di diabetes at this stage. It also provides immunity to the gut to ward off harmful bacteria which cause NEC. Gut colonization occurs at the same time as the baby adapts to extra uterine life. That is why it is absolutely essential that we start getting the babies feeding within six hours of delivery, or at least getting the colostrum presented within uh, the colostrum starting to excrete within six hours of delivery. It is important that these babies are definitely um, that the moms are, are told prior to delivery that they are going to need to milk and that they um, are able to do, uh, uh, they, they are able to produce colostrum as early as possible. The longer you leave the mother hand expressing, the less milk you're going to have, the less breast milk you're going to have. And the rule of thumb is if a mother can produce 500 mils of breast milk by day 10 in 24 hour period, she will be able to feed that baby successfully at least to four months corrected. Gut colonization includes, but is not limited to a vaginal delivery, breastfeeding and skin to skin. So, with vaginal deliveries, there's gut colonization. With breastfeeding, there's gut colonization. And with skin to skin, there's gut colonization. Those of you who have been following the lecture series have had the privilege of hearing the doctors, Dr. Paul Cowley and Dr. Paul Clark, talking on how important skin to skin right at the beginning is. Um, in babies under 33 weeks, they are often very often colonized with candida species during their, their, their stay in NICU. And this can be extremely problematic long-term. Basic procedures in NICU will affect the gut biome. So events such as placing a nasogastric tube, suctioning, or placing IV therapy can change the gut biome. Previously, we thought meconium to be sterile, but we now know that it already contains bacteria. So the baby does swallow certain friendly bacteria during its stay within the, um, the uterus. Breast milk and colostrum both contain prebiotics and probiotics, and both of these play a very important role in preventing the multifactorial disease NEC. 
Colostrum allows for brain maturation. It doesn't prevent any C, but it helps stable. Oh, that it should read it doesn't prevent IVH, but it helps stabilize the gray matter. Colostrum is very high in HMOs, and this acts as an in, a, 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 in, um, in, acts in an anti inflammatory effect. Breastfed babies have a much better or a much broader gut biome or, or a diversity to that of a formula fed baby and buckle feeding is shown to be essential. The role of colostrum in human milk. So why is it important, even if that's all we manage to do is get colostrum and some breast milk down there, why is it essential? Well, in the first place, it prevents what we call leaky gut syndrome. So when the baby is born, the gut is what we call open. So the gut is very permeable. And if we have organisms that happen to go down into the gut that shouldn't be there, they very easily will cross over. So if you look at this picture here, this is supposed to be a gut that has been stimulated with colostrum, and you can see that there are tight junctions here. While this gut here is what we call leaky. So the, the, you can see the parasites and the microorganisms as they are shown here, these guys, these funny looking guys here, they can essentially move through the gut wall and end up in the bloodstream, therefore causing late onset sepsis. That's one of them. So it could, if, it could then cause these, you can see them here, the microorganisms, going as far as crossing the blood-brain barrier. It could also long-term cause food intolerance. There could be an autoimmune issue, and we can have malabsorption there. So it's very important that this gut gets locked early on with some colostrum. Here you can see the same thing happening. This is if there are no oligosaturates. Now, if you want to see what an oligosaturate is symbolized at, that is considered to be what an oligosaturide looks like. You can clearly see all these superheroes here. So if we go back here, if there are, if there are oligosaturides, what you can see is that they act as a decoy. Do you see that? Look how they attract the bacteria and they prevent the attachment. So the bacteria can't attach the way it should do. And so now all of this can signal and continue in the cell. So it's not just madness when we say, please feed colostrum. Colostrum is very high in oligosaccharides while this bowel is going to lock. It takes about 48 hours to happen. And that in itself will prevent late onset sepsis. What is the importance of buccal feeding? Feeding colostrum orally benefits the baby in many ways. The uptake of the colostrum is not in the stomach. So a lot of you would say, but if we put it in the mouth, the baby could choke, it can't swallow. That's what we're learning. Well, guys, it's not going to be absorbed or swat going down the gate, the, 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 the down the esophagus. It is actually placed here and absorbed here. The uptake of colostrum is not in the stomach, but by the lymphatic system, and it's redirected to the GIT as well as the brain. The volume hasn't really been studied, and currently in units that use buccal feeding, they use anything from 0.1 to 0.5 mils on either side. And it can be given PRN. It can be given fairly regularly because remember that breast milk also contains sugars and sugars settle babies down. It's the best way to prevent NEC and it can be used to settle a baby down. If the baby is just not happy, you can put a tiny amount of breast milk in its mouth between feeds and it will settle down. 
Now, <clears throat> there's a whole new con concept considered the blood milk barrier. Very often when we say, why, has the, why haven't we started breast milk? We get all sorts of questions, all sorts of stories. The baby, the mother's on high anti-hypertensives. Um, the mother is on a lot of antibiotics. The mother is on psychiatric antidepressants. Firstly, please consider that we can now prove that there's a blood milk barrier. So when breast milk is made in the breast, it doesn't run along and say, please can I have a little bit of broccoli, a little bit of spinach, a little bit of lactose. No, guys, that doesn't happen. There's this story, and I don't know what it is like at the, in, in the rest of the world, but it, I, I'm sure it's similar. You hear all sorts of stories like moms mustn't take lactose. That causes the baby to be uncomfortable. No, it is not true because there is a blood milk barrier. And anyway, it, it doesn't, what you eat doesn't end up there as broccoli. It ends up as a building block, as an, as, as an amino acid. So many medications actually are not that harmful and do not re reach the baby in significant doses. If the medication is given IV, it will not cross over the blood milk barrier. The intact blood milk barrier prevents an uncontrolled exchange of soluble and cellular components between blood and milk in the mammary gland. It enables the sustainability of optimal milk composition for the nourishment of the baby. So look here, it's orally available, it's absorbed in the bloodstream, it is able to cross into the milk. It's orally available to the baby, it's absorbed in the baby's GRT and then goes into the bloodstream. So even something like morphine will, by the time it's absorbed here, be in a very small dose. And perhaps we'll get to a point where we don't just stop breast milk feeding. We've got to consider that breast milk, other than a placenta, is the best thing we can give our prem baby. Even with breast milk, we are still seeing malnourished babies discharged out of intensive care when they go home, even with breast milk, because the optimal way to feed a baby to term is via the placenta. Second best is breast milk. And this is very often where we start seeing problems, developmental delays is when a baby hasn't had sufficient feeding. So what I want to cover here and talk to you here about is about why we should be feeding colostrum, why we should be getting these babies up and running as soon as possible. Firstly, as I've said to you, there's a maturation of the brain with colostrum. Colostrum in the human lasts for about four days. It is a very yellow milk most often, and it is usually given for the first four days. Even if the mother brings you colostrum and your baby is nil per os, freeze that colostrum so that when you start feeding that baby, you can actually start giving the baby the um, benefit of colostrum. Buckle feeding, in my experience, doesn't actually affect the null per os situation with the baby, and it might actually be beneficial keeping that baby as stable as possible. When we go to see a mother or to talk to a mother about um, milking and, and, and expressing breast milk prior to a cesarean section, if the baby is going to be coming to your neonatal unit, or you can talk to your colleagues in maternity about it, it is essential that you explain to a mother that she will still excrete growth hormone 
across the um, in, in the breast milk and it will stimulate the baby to grow as optimally as possible. It does prevent NEC and after um, a quick break, we will talk about NEC. It also helps the, stabilize the baby and the, the actual contents of it. So formula does not have sufficient magnesium to actually stimulate that bowel and get it going. And it is essential that we feed these babies properly as much as we can. So within the first six hours, the mother needs to, to be helped to hand express. And even if she gets five drops of, of colostrum, that's fine. Then we just give those five moles, uh, those five drops of colostrum, and we carry on encouraging her. One of the biggest mistakes made is that people think that they don't need to express throughout the night. Firstly, breast milk adapts for the level of prematurity. So the breast milk from a 26 weeker is very different in composition to that of a 36 weeker or a 46 weeker baby. That's the first thing to remember. So the milk the mother is producing is probably the best milk that baby can be getting. Secondly, what we need to understand is that breast milk that is expressed, it stimulates it. So it stimulates more breast milk. So the mum mustn't be said, oh, you know what, it's fine, go to sleep and I'll wake you at six o'clock. If the baby was going to feed three hourly, she must express three hourly so that that milk can be stimulated. There are lots of um, stories of all sorts of, in South Africa, we, they, they, they give these moms something called jungle juice to drink. I personally don't think that it works. Um, and my feeling is that you're far better giving the mom a very healthy protein sort of backed supplement with sufficient fluid intake to get the milk going. Milk basically in the primer will take about three days to come in. In a mom that's breastfed before, you will get more milk that will come in. And then the important thing is that she is taught to, to, to express hygienically and that we, as soon as possible, start feeding those babies. Um, some uh, uh, countries um, have breast milk banks, which are wonderful. And the, these babies will then receive pasteurized milk from a breast milk bank, which is donated. It depends on how the breast milk banks work. In South Africa, we have two systems of breast milk banks. We have what we call age-appropriate breast milk bank, which are with one um, private medic, uh, medical group, whereby they are able to give um, preemies within their hospital group preemie milk. They are able to give their pre their micro preemies micro preemie milk, and then um, they are able to give term milk. Then we also have another breast um, milk bank, whereby the breast milk there is different. That is taken from older uh, mothers who are older postpartum. And so that, that could also be done. It's not as nutritious, but um, it does its job. And obviously supplementation of breast milk does become quite important, especially if we want decent weight gain on these babies, which we will be discussing a little bit earlier. Margarita, are there any questions? Okay, so the first question uh, is Maxolon secreted in breast milk? I have heard that it may cause neonatal ataxia. <laughs> Maxolon, um, if, if Maxolon is going to cause um, any problem, Ataxia, no. Um, Valoid would, um, and I don't know what the, um, I can't think of its um, generic name right now. You would see that, but not Maxillon. In actual fact, 
there, there are movements afoot now to stop using Espiri um, as a breast milk stimulant in South Africa and to rather give the mothers um, Domiperidron, which in this country is known as um, Motilium. And Maxilon is known to actually um, stimulate breast milk. So no, um, it would have to be in a toxic level in the mother to actually cause a problem for the baby. No, definitely not. Excellent, thank you, Linda. And we have now a few more questions. Um, the next question is, how appropriate is to feed a baby, especially preterm born, with severe respiratory distress? So, you know, the, um, the movement country or worldwide now is to look at the baby exceptionally holistic. Severe respiratory distress, I would hope that we are not allowing the child to or the baby to breathe away at an incredible speed and not have them on CPAP or not have them ventilated. Um, they should not be working very hard, um, you know, uh, severely. Um, and a lot of um, doctors will be cautious not feeding them. What I do need to explain to you is that you've got to understand that the any baby is what we call a nasal breather. So they breathe only through their, no, their noses. They are incapable of opening their mouths. Now, if you've got severe respiratory distress, you should not be putting a nasogastric tube down the nose. It should then become an orogastric tube because once you put a fairly big bored nasogastric tube in, what you are doing is you're blocking 50% of that child's nasal passage to breathe in. So that would be the first thing. And then if on top of everything else, you've got nasal cannula there plus an NG tube, it could still be problematic. So um, severe respiratory distress today we should, in, in the premi, we should have considered giving um, surfactant. Um, I think it's fairly standard, even in um, countries where we don't have a lot of money, such as South Africa. We do try still and give the surfactant as early as possible to prevent severe respiratory distress. But keep that baby, if it's TTN, should settle down. Um, should settle down within a, 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 a within a twenty four hour period. Um, so we should consider our nursing um, principles when we're dealing with respiratory distress. Are we turning these children prone so that we get best lung usage, as we discussed in the um, respiratory block? Are we maintaining an open airway all the way? So replacing the roll under the shoulders and supporting the soft airway. Um, have we got our oxygen at the right percentage and at the right flow? And within 24 hours, we should be seeing an improvement. Excellent, thank you, Linda. Um, the next question, since colostrum is so important, how does the seriously and critically ill neonates get it in early life? So there's, there's um, a fair amount of, of work being done in, um, so you can freeze it, as I said, if the mother brings it, you can put it in the fridge and the minute that you are going to start feeding that baby, you feed it that colostrum, that would be first prize. In South Africa, in actual fact, we have been able to get our multiple uh, multipara mothers who have breastfed before and who have a big breast um, 
a, a, a big milk production on day two and three, what, we've, what we would do with those mothers is we would ask them to donate 100 mils of that milk because it is still colostrum. And we will then send that off to the um, milk bank and have it pasteurized and then dispense it in syringes of about 10 mils. And that 10 mils is slowly given to the baby buccally over um, a period of time once we know the baby is a bit more stable. So, you know, these the w these weeks of not feeding babies has actually shown to be detrimental and they it leads to late onset sepsis the minute the baby is stable feeding should be considered great thank you so much um the next question is it safe to feed babies in NICU with breast milk that is put in cups first Look, the World Health Organization asks that we do not bottle feed, um, but that we cup feed, except that when you look at their criteria for baby friendly initiatives, which is quite followed quite widely throughout Asia and Africa, um, they are not actually that against um, feeding uh, with with bottles um, because the baby has to suck, swallow, breathe. With cup feeding, there can be a problem um, if the staff are not very good at cup feeding, that there is a, a, bit, a bigger chance of aspiration. Um, if it is what happens in your country or what is required by World Health, World Health Organization, it has to be done and people have to be taught to do it um, very skillfully. And, you know, it, then it needs to be done that way. Um, very often countries are dependent on the World Health Organization for some help. Um, neonatal deaths are tracked worldwide um, correctly so, very vigilantly. And if that is what is advised, then that is what we have to do. We in South Africa do cup feed. Um, we have um, a, 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 a large, well, I wouldn't say large, but we have quite a few KMC units. Um, and all those units cup feed their babies. The mothers get taught to cup feed those babies. So they are cup fed. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, the final question for this round is when ordering donor breast milk from a milk bank, would you recommend we become specific that we need uh, donor breast milk from a preemie mother? if we are ordering for a premature baby? So it, it, it is very hard to do that in that um, the breast milk bank has to be geared to, to, um, to do that. So I will explain this, the, the system in South Africa, how it works. Um, so this hospital group have breast milk banks they take breast milk from mothers who are um, six weeks or, or less than six weeks postpartum. They ask the mothers to donate that have a lot of milk. They ask the mothers in the neonatal units to donate their excess, neon, um, their excess milk. And that milk is then captured on a system with an algorithm so it can calculate at what stage the breast milk that for that week is. So say for instance, I donate, I, I, my baby was 27 weeks, but I donate the milk today and my baby's 33 weeks and this week's milk that I've donated is this week's milk. It, that will be classified as 33 week milk. However, breast milk banks worldwide don't always work like that. There are various ways of doing breast milk banks. Um, there's 
pooling of milk that can occur. So they put everybody's milk together, um, pasteurize it, and then send it out. You can have individual donor milk, such as in this group, whereby the person donating the milk, it works exactly like a breast, like a blood bank would work. So the milk, the donor milk has a unique number, and you can trace the donor to uh, you can trace the, the milk that you receive to a specific donor. So it depends on how the breast, how sophisticated the breast milk bank is. Um, other human milk banks do not um, track them so severely. And so then it isn't as sophisticated. But you would still give breast milk rather than formula irrespective of what it is, because the quality is still superior. Margarita? Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda, for this great and very in-depth explanation. I think it was already very valuable insight. All right. Thank you very much um, for staying with us. And we can now continue with our second part of Linda's presentation. After the second part, um, I'm going to do a short demonstration on the kangaroo support and how we can support the uh, family integration in the NICU with Drager portfolio. So, um, Linda, um, thank you so much, and we can continue with the lecture now. Thank you. So now we're going to discuss NEC or necrotizing enterocolitis. Now, um, <clears throat> previously in years gone by, and I'm not giving away my age, we saw a lot more NEC than we see today. And the reason for this is, is that in years gone by, we used a lot more formula and we didn't look at donor milk and we didn't look at getting milk from moms. Since um, uh, uh, utilizing breast milk exclusively for the micro premies and the premies, we have found that the NEC numbers have dropped considerably. In um, South Africa, we have one unit that only feeds breast milk. Um, they use no formula at all in that unit. And that unit has not seen NEC for I think it's now about eight or nine years. They do not have babies that are born at that facility who has NEC. They will accept babies for surgery, but they haven't, not their own babies are there. Having said that, um, NEC is what we call a multifactorial disease. And I will explain to you exactly how it happens or what we think it happens. So when we look at it, it develops when the inner lining of the intestine becomes inflamed and permeable, and this is likely to cause sepsis. So remember when we earlier discussed the leaky bowel, that bowel is open, and this NEC is often, if you go back, when a child presents with NEC, if you go back 24 to 48 hours prior to the NEC developing, you will often find an incident whereby the baby has been severely apneic for a period of time, so had repeated apnea attacks, or the baby actually arrested and needed resuscitation. And what happens is that when the body needs blood when the body is, is in that sort of state where it's in an apneic state where the baby actually stops breathing, the heart rate drops, the body's fight and flight kicks in. And so what it does is it empties the bowel for a very short period of its blood to maintain its other organs. And when the blood comes back, we get what is known as a reperfusion injury. So little holes start developing in the bowel and the bacteria leaks out and that's where we start seeing problems. As I said, it's often mostly in premies, micro premies and premies. It happens at about 36 to 48 hours following resuscitation. 
very often. Formula fed babies are very prone to NEC and babies kept milk per mouth are at risk as well and it is mostly a rapidly progressive disease. So if you look at this baby, they often in the old books talk about a green abdomen. You can clearly see from the color here, it's distended. The baby will present with green aspirates. And when you do the x-ray, you can see all this tracking here. You can see the air. You can see that there's air actually here under the, dive, uh, under the liver here. And you can see these what is known as tracks. So, the signs and symptoms, there's abdominal distension, there's green aspirates, the babies become severely acidotic, there's hypo or hyperglycemia, there's vomiting, there could be blood in the stool, and there's abdominal discoloration. I pointed it out to you in this picture, the so-called green abdomen. There you can see the little holes and the perforations. And you can see how ill this child really is. This child has a tube in at the moment to drain the air in the bowel. You can clearly see here. And this child has had a repair. There's a lot of bowel that has been resected. And so they've given this child a colostomy. You can see that. And this is how it looks like. So NEC can be staged, and it, we use the bowel stage criteria, so it's bowels one, two, or three, suspected NEC, mild abdominal distension, poor feeding, there might be vomiting. Very often here, there's a green aspirate. There's, there's a mild ileus, and ileus means that the, 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 there is no peristalsis, and the baby will have a medical workup for sepsis. They'll very often keep milk for us here, and we will discuss that once we've discussed NEC as to keeping them milk per us and, and, and what the long-term effects are. A definite NEC, the same as above, plus there's marked abdominal distension and bloody stools. There's a significant ileus. There's a pneumatis intestinus. There's portal venous gas. On this x-ray, you can see it there. And it's treated medically. Then we get advanced NEC. It's the same as above, but now this baby has become severely unstable. It's a septic shock. There's pneumoperitoneum, football sign indicating severe disruption of the intestinal body. So there's a bowel perforation. These children need surgical intervention. The rule of thumb is that if you have removed 30 centimeters or more of bowel, there is a very high risk chance of that baby dying because they are going to develop what we call short bowel syndrome. So it's very difficult to get a baby post NEC who's had 30, 30 centimeters or more of bowel removed um, to keep them, uh, to actually keep them alive. The um, problem as well is that with short bowel syndrome, they have poor absorption and they're very, very susceptible to further sepsis. So what is the treatment initially? We keep them null per os and decompress the stomach. So we'll remove the smaller nasogastric tube, put in a bigger nasogastric tube. We will keep them on IV therapy. We will do an abdominal chest, like an abdominal x-ray with shoot through. We will give antibiotics. We have do have to give pain relief. Um, there is a need for oxygen and very often doctors commence oxygen even if the babies were off oxygen because they want good bowel perfusion and they want to prevent um, any sort of perforation 
and they will start TPN to feed them as best they can. Then we have um, something called SIP or spontaneous intestinal per perforation of the newborn. Now, previously, this used to fall under the NEC group, but it isn't that. It is different. So where NEC is known to develop in premature infants with a history of stress, hypoxia, and shock, which leads to a hyperperfused bowel, spontaneous intestinal perforation, or SIP, seems to be associated with low APGARs, premature rupture of membranes, and CPR. And it generally um, involves the ileum, the transverse, and the descending colon. So there's usually only one hole. It's usually either in the ileum, the transverse, the, and descending colons, and not across the bowel where with NEC, you will see it across the bowel. SIP is often misdiagnosed as NEC. And SIP generally occurs in term infants, often with birth hypoxia. And it appears more often in males. It usually happens between day seven to 10. It can affect preterm babies. It's very often seen in very low birth weight babies. There's meconial, there's mucosinal thinning, and more often than not, there's no sign of ischemia. Often seen in babies with raised cortisol levels, as according to this article by Dr. Waterberg. And Babies with raised cortisol um, levels will be these very low birth weight babies. The so-called, in the old term, we used to refer to them as the SGA babies, small for gestational age babies. They are more likely to be um, at risk of developing SIP. How does SIP present? There's abdominal distension, there's vomiting, there's a history of constipation or no stools being passed. On chest x-ray, there's pneumoperitoneum. Blood often shows us a sepsis when we do a blood screen, and they may require drainage or resection. But generally, it's only that part of the bowel, and the outcome for these children are generally, these babies are quite good. Sorry. Then, so those are the two surgical occurrences that occur and what we, what we term iatrogenic, meaning that it is not something, so you do not develop NEC in a pregnancy and you do not develop SIP in a pregnancy. It happens in a neonatal ICU unit, often due to sepsis. But now we have to look at what we call a TOF or a, tra a tracheal esophageal fistula. So right in the beginning, when we spoke about the primal gut, we were talking about the foregut. This is a birth defect in the foregut. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that we've got the normal anatomy, meaning that we've got the bronchi here and, 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 and the airway here, and we've got the stomach here. Atresia with a distal fistula means that we've got some esophagus here, but for some reason, the stomach has attached here to the airway. Or we can have it in that situation. This is commonly known as a double fistula or an H um, birth defect. This one, it's attached there. Here, we don't have any attachment, and here, there's a problem. Now, in this situation here, it's generally a fairly straightforward procedure. In this one, it could be a straightforward procedure. But these two, it becomes problematic because there may not be sufficient esophageal tissue 
to get them to meet one another and we'll have to pull this esophagus up to get it to anastomose to make it connected very often these babies are very sick post um, surgery surgery they are very very difficult because what happens is that they will come back they can even come back with their chin stitched to their um, to their chests allowing for as much stretch as we possibly can get in this esophagus to encourage it to grow this one might actually repair fairly easily but these two are very often a very difficult repair these children are often very very ill um, and they will be ventilated on return so in this child when you pass the nasogastric tube when the baby arrives in icu you may actually battle and you'll feel that it keeps returning keeps returning Sometimes these babies are only um, diagnosed later on when they present with what is so-called aspiration pneumonia. These children get sick very quickly when you feed them. This child, again, the nasogastric tube will return. This child will present fairly later often because they are regurgitating up into the um, into the um, bronchi there. This is the so-called geodenal um, uh, atresia. So there's air here, post stomach. This one is in the jejunum. So the jejunum is not attached to the stomach. It's what we call the double bubble, which you can see there. Also a difficult repair. Other um, anomalies that we will see. So um, here we have what we what we did as a case history last um, last last lecture series, which is congenital diaphragmatic hernia or a congenital lung. So what's happened is in that twelfth week and a bit later, the diaphragm hasn't closed properly. We've got intestines in the chest here. The heart has moved over. We've got poor development of lung here and here. These babies are very sick and they very often don't survive. This baby here is what we call a gastroschisis. Luckily, these babies are often now diagnosed early on with a fetal um, scan. If this baby is diagnosed um, with its fetal scan and it is um, diagnosed and the parents don't terminate the pregnancy, very often these babies are delivered at 32 weeks because that is optimally when we can get gut back into the stomach. Um, they will initially attach something called a Gore-Tex patch. So they stitch it there, there, and there, and they slowly push the intestine back in. They hope there's enough um, gut wall to bring together muscular wall, and then those babies hopefully repair. These babies often suffer from reflux because you can think for yourself that there's poor muscular development there. This baby is what we could call an exomphalus or an umbacil. So that, those intestines there, do not have the sac that this one has. These intestines are all over the show and they're very difficult to get back. Therefore, the glad wrap or the sarin wrap as, as it's called elsewhere in the world. Um, upon that, just be very careful what sarin wrap you use to do this because some of them are actually quite high in toxins and we should not be using them in neonatal intensive care. But if all else fails and that's all we've got, that's all we've got and we do that. This has to stay moist. This membrane here keeps the baby moist. And so this will allow for the attachment of a Gore-Tex patch. Um, and these babies often do better than those babies also, again, at 32 weeks. Interestingly enough, 
we have seen the numbers go up for this condition. Very often, it is found in mums who have abused cocaine. So early on in pregnancy, there's been cocaine usage. Remember what I said at about week eight to 10, the gut starts developing. She's still using, we would see that. This baby here is missing an anus. So what they would do with this baby long term is they would give it a, 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 a they'll give it a colostomy and then later go in and actually make the anus. Um, in most instances, that is what occurs. Now we are going to talk about nasogastric feeding because those are the basic abdominal problems that we will see in children. When we look at nasogastric feeding, we have to place the nasogastric tube correctly. And the measurement is from the tip of the nose to the tip of the ear to where the stomach should be. Here's the belly button. There's the base of the chest and it sits, the stomach sits here. Nasogastric tubes are placed when babies are too sick or premature or have a poor suck reflex and need to be fed. Nasogastric tubes are usually placed by the nose unless the baby has severe respiratory distress. And the reason for that is that in actual fact, only newborn babies should be intubated via their noses and have nasogastric tubes via their noses because they do not actually have sinus tissue up here. There's very little sinus tissue. So the chance of them getting a sinusitis is virtually zero. Whereas in the older child and the adult, we do not use nasogastric intubation, a nasal intubation, unless it's for a short procedure. We try and put in the smallest possible tube, usually a six or a five French. And only if you need to decompress the stomach do we use a bigger tube. The goal is to get to full feeds as soon as you possibly can. Nasogastric tubes need to be done according to a protocol or a standard operating procedure. In most instances, it is suggested that a nasogastric tube is changed every three to four days or twice a week. Nasogastric tubes are not left in ad nauseum because they can attach to um, the nasal passage or the back of, and, and, and that is problematic. So they do need to be changed. Very often the babies decide when they will change them themselves. They often remove them quite easily. The placing of a nasogastric tube is a clean procedure. You need a dressing trolley. You have to do a social hand wash and spray. You measure from tip to ear to sternal tip. Ensure that the tube is lubricated. Please don't just push it down. It's not a pleasant experience. And you've got to test that the tube is in the correct place. And um, you've got to make sure that you do not creates a problem when you strap down the nasogastric tube. So it is very important that you make sure that A, you're in the stomach, and there's various ways of doing that. The um, optimal one is with um, a pH stick where you test the pH and you, and you have that. Um, pH sticks in Africa are very expensive, so we use litmus paper. We also will put a small amount of air in, listening at the same time using a stethoscope, listening over the stomach. And if you put like a milliliter of air in, you'll hear this brrr as it goes in. Um, we will draw back on it and see if we can get gastric aspirate. And you can do an x-ray to check that the um, tube is in place. Just on x-rays. Guys, once a child starts presenting with NEC or severe respiratory distress, children have a lot of x-rays done. And yes, they don't use the same amount of exposure that they use in adults, but 
Repeated x-rays can be problematic, not only to you, if you're there and you haven't worn a thyroid cover and an x-ray gown, but it can be problematic to the baby that you are doing the x-rays on. Please make sure that you cover their gonads. Where are the gonads? Well, it's basically just below the umbilicus. You have to place, um, they often use um, thyroid covers or they will use um, old x-rays, old x-ray gowns that have been redone. But you have to, have to, once you start doing x-rays daily, you have to cover the gonads because long term, it can lead to sterility in these babies. So as I said, how do we check? We can auscultate, litmus paper, pH test, air, and an abdominal x-ray. Very often when you draw back, you'll get back some milky curd. That's a fairly good um, confirmation where you are. Next, we're going to talk about growth of the infant. And this is where we very often become negligent. In the first place, please be aware that there are different growth charts. There are actually go growth charts available for very low birth weight premature infants. This is one of them. There is also a World Health one that's available. The only problem for a World Health Organization growth chart is that it only goes to 50 weeks, but it goes back further this way. If you look at this one very carefully and your eyes work, you can clearly see it only starts at about 38 weeks and then term and then it carries on and it carries on that way. So you may need to use a combination of both, but growth charts for premature infants are different to growth charts for full-term infants. Also remember that a bottle fed or a formula fed, not a bottle fed, a formula fed infant will gain weight slower than a breast fed infant for the first six months of life. And after first six months of life, they'll gain weight quicker than a breastfed baby. It is important that you do the growth measurements, all three of them, which includes the weight, the height, and please don't follow the contours of the baby. It is from the, the, the tip of the crown, from the crown to the heel. Don't try and follow contours. That doesn't work. We don't measure like that. And then the circumference of head, which is over the broadest part of the head. When we are in intensive care, it should be done weekly on the correct chart. Um, and this discussion must happen between the pediatricians, the dietitians, and the people working in the ward. It needs to actually happen on the same day every week. Any fall must be addressed as soon as possible. Yes, babies grow brain sparingly, meaning that the heads often grow, but the bodies slow down. But we have to track it and do it as soon as possible. Supplementation for these babies becomes absolutely essential. And we have to involve Firstly, as Margarita said, family integrated care, meaning the parents are involved all the time, as well as developmental care. Now, this is where we start to see the problem. Because very often, you will get the story, oh, this baby's so busy in the incubator. He's all over the show. There is no reason for your baby to be all over the show in the incubator. Once the IV therapy is down, once we are feeding, babies should be swaddled for two reasons. One, they're developing proprioceptive sense 
And two, it reduces their energy use because we need to midline that baby. What would that specific baby be doing if it was in utero? It sure can't move its limbs all over the show. Swaddling is essential. It stops energy loss. There's an incredible amount of energy gets lost from babies flailing around in incubators. From a developmental care point of view, the parent needs to see on an ongoing basis that the baby is growing. It helps with their depression and their care. And what I forgot to mention when I said how important it was that the mother's encouraged to give breast milk. One of the ways we use in South Africa is we encourage the use of cotton bonding squares. They are most often knitted. And what we do is we ask the mommy to wear the one bonding square as a breast pad. Milk drips onto that. In that milk, there is A, serotonin, and B, the baby is able to smell mom because breast milk, amniotic fluid, and mommy's skin smell the same. Once a baby can smell mommy, the baby can settle down a bit more, and you've got improved developmental care. However, when that mother takes that bonding square because she's meant to replace it every day when she visits, so tomorrow she brings the other square, we usually give them two squares. That square that she takes home, we suggest she smells that while she's expressing breast milk because she may not know it, but her brain does. Again, the brain now smells the baby and that helps with the production of milk. So breast um, um, bonding squares are quite important. If you happen to work with the baby and the bonding square is there and you know mom is going to come, rub the baby's skin with the bonding square so that you get more transfer of the baby's smell. During the baby's stay, it becomes essential that the circumference of head is monitored and that it shows growth. And it should be on the curve it's growing at. If it doesn't, you need to show this to the doctors because if it's overgrowing, we need to investigate for hydrocephalus. If it's undergrowing, we need to investigate for brain retardation, for the brain not growing. Whatever it is, you need to track it. It's important. Very often, the head will grow, as I said, in its normal pace, but the length and the weight will lag. That can happen. We must just keep an eye on it. The baby needs to catch up all three parameters by nine months corrected out to escape neurodevelopmental problems. That brain tissue needs to grow and it needs feed and food to grow. That is why in the babies that are sent home and they land up in our system, we ask the mothers to start feeding earlier than suggested by World Health Organization. We like to feed, um, start oral um, solids at four months correct, because that means that if there has been and there will be and there is, malnutrition when the baby leaves NICU, you can catch up with it earlier by feeding normal natural food. I've left you an article here that was published um, in May with regards to growth and brain sparing. Now, when we feed intensive care, feeding in intensive care becomes a very, very important part of what you're doing. Over time, the ability to look after the small, um, the very small and very ill preemie has improved dramatically. However, this has become, this has given increased risks to the baby's nutritional state, growth, motor, psychological and sensory systems. 
the lack of feeding skills is the biggest reason for babies not being discharged on time. Feeding issues will persist long after the baby has been discharged. And Hay Howden has shown that although only 1% of babies require pegs, 50% of all the babies discharged from NICU will have feeding problems in the next 24 months. And this is a problem. Sucking on a pacifier and sucking on a bottle or a nipple are not the same. You do not have to be able to coordinate, suck, swallow, breathe when you have a pacifier in your mouth. When you are given a nipple or a bottle and you have to suck, swallow, feed, a, a, a breathe, and you cannot coordinate it. We have to ask ourselves two questions. One, is the baby too immature to be doing this, i.e. under 34 weeks corrected? B, has there been significant brain damage not allowing this child to suck, swallow, breathe? The feeding problems that occur post NICU, up to about 80% of them, have been caused in the NICU. So, if you were to look at this top picture, and um, I'm sure my Australian colleagues and my um, African colleagues can can identify what that is. That is what we call cattle tracks. This is the way cattle tracks look when cattle are sent out to feed every day. And what often happens, or what does happen, is that Daisy walks along there, Flower walks along there, um, Buttercup will walk along there, and I don't know who the next cow's name is, she will walk along there. But you can see there are various cattle tracks here. This here is a highway or a decent road. This formation in the brain often happens when nurses just feed haphazardly. This is what happens when there is actually a feeding protocol in a unit and everybody does the same thing. Stress, and when I say stress, the stress hormone oxytocin, uh, um, the stress hormone cortisol alters the motor and sensory pathways in a developing brain. Remember, and we will cover this in December, the brain between 26 weeks to 40 weeks has to grow 70%. The brain at 26 weeks is smooth. The brain at 40 weeks has got convolutions. Your intelligence sits in your convolutions. If the pathways have been haphazard, this is what happens in that brain. Together with this, there is the practice. Well, let's, let's just talk about it. So a baby is stressed in intensive care. They go into what we call flight and fright. So they're either, they, they, they're constantly in this shocked state and they're over-secreting cortisol. The pathways in that developing brain change. And this later on leads to feeding difficulties in the first 24 months of life. One of the biggest reasons for this to happen is when nurse A likes bottle B, nurse B likes bottle C, nurse C likes bottle D. And as they're feeding these babies, they are using different teats, different feeding methods, and you will find that the pacifier and the 
the bottle that you're using to feed actually do not correlate and this confuses the babies no it's not nipple confusion they just don't have sufficient pathway to suck this is most likely the biggest reason for hospitals insisting on cup feeding because this person likes brand A and that person likes brand B and that person likes brand C and mom likes brand F. And now we have big problems. The pathways are established, the pathways established should be stress-free and pleasant to the baby. Guys, you do not put a nipple or a bottle in a, in a baby's mouth that is crying. One of our biggest problems today is obesity. Obesity in children and young people. Why? Because we do not teach our children to eat mindfully. We allow them to eat in front of a television. We allow them to read um, a, a, a tablet while they're eating. You just do the experiment. Just see how often you eat your meal watching the TV and are you saturated? Are you full at the end of that or do you go and look for a snack? You have to feed a baby mindfully. Only a calm, organized baby can establish good feed pathways supported by motor and sensory systems. I personally like to rock my babies for four to five minutes while they are swaddled to feed them because if they are swaddled I have no reflexes interrupting my feeding. They are midlining and the rocking is the stibula it clears the brain. It allows that baby to go into what we call quiet alert and they are able to feed. Vital signs change, the vital sign changes occur very quickly. And if feeding is done while a baby is, 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 is having an apnea, this is to that baby's detriment. The baby needs to be organized from a motor neuromotor system. It needs to be in a quiet alert feeding phase and it needs to be able to self-regulate. In other words, maintain its hemodynamics to feed correctly. And a baby that has got constant apneas cannot be fed. It must rather be fed nasogastrically. If disrupted, the baby will be unable to suck, swallow, breathe, and to control motor and physiological control. Babies who spill, in other words, as you see here, this is called spilling, this. When that happens, stop. They are starting to, 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 to have problems, stop. So, what is the problem with feeding? They have large they have large tongue. In actual fact, they don't have a large tongue. It's because they've got this recessive chin. The chin is back here. The tongue appears big. They are low toned, especially premies. They have a large, heavy head. They need to be able to suck, swallow, and breathe. And they are a nasal breather. It is very important that the baby can do this suck, swallow, breathe. This is what needs to happen. The swallowing so that the milk will go down and we've got this protection. Very important. So, do you feed babies unswaddled? Do you like a big hole to feed them with? Do you prod with the bottle? Do you move it in and out, in and out, in and out? 
instead of holding it up against the palate. Do you use chin support? Do you allow the bare head to fall back? And do you and try and feed a baby if it has disengaged? If so, you are not feeding correctly. And are you a volume feeder? So in your unit, do we chase volume? There, there is this habit in South Africa and some of the units, they say one bottle a day. A baby must finish a full bottle before he can move on to the next bottle. Guys, that's absurd. Why not? How do you run a marathon? By running every day. I cannot on Sunday decide I'm getting up and I'm running a marathon today. I'll never make it. I'll end up in intensive care. But if I've run for the last four months every day and I've started running 5Ks and then 10Ks and then 18Ks, then I can run a marathon. Rather, let the baby feed regularly, i.e. every feed or every second feed, and let them feed till they spill. When they spill, stop. Now you ask yourself one question. Is this baby tired or has he lost concentration? How do I know that? By rocking the baby. So what are signs of disengagement? No active root or sucking reflex. The baby is floppy. It pushes out the nipple. You often see this picture. The hands come up. It returns to non nutritive sucking and it turns its head away. One of the biggest issues when you start feeding with a nipple is that your dummies or your pacifiers, as you might call them elsewhere, have been too small. So if a baby has had a pacifier in its mouth that has been too small for its mouth, it will suck in the incorrect place. The small baby's pacifier lets it suck in the front of its palate. Whereas a big one makes it, or a correct pacifier makes it suck, center palate. You need pressure on the center palate to get proper sucking. When we feed in ICU, we need to make sure the baby feels safe, it's alert, and it's going to feel safe during the feed. This needs to be a meaningful, positive feeding experience. The best place to feed a baby is on the mummy while she is doing skin to skin or kangaroo mother care. She can hold the tube, she can feed the baby. By communicating and reading the baby's communication, the nurse will reduce the stress during feeding. And the nurse is the only element that can problem, problem solve here. The baby can't do that. Feeding isn't mindless, it is mindful. What are the signs during feeding of stress? The sleep state that turns the baby to drowsy or it's crying. A change in posture, tone or movement, i.e. flailing its hands all over the show. That's a sign of distress. A change in vital signs, nasal flaring, apneas, gulping, spilling or coughing. How do you support a baby during feeding? Make sure you've got the correct baby, the correct feed, the correct heat, nipple, and the correct time. This can be quite confusing in intensive care. Assess the baby for early feeding skills. Can it actually feed? Do exercises and vestibular movement if necessary. Swaddle the baby, feed the baby more up, upright, not lying down completely. 
you may have to pace the baby by coordinating or removing the nipple. Keep the baby calm. Avoid tapping, prodding, or rolling the bottle. Now, um, we are going to discuss a few things, um, and I will um, tell you, but just on this tapping, prodding, rolling the bottle, a lot of nurses do use those techniques. A lot of them tap the back of the bottle to keep the baby sucking. I have had two children that at six months of age, the mother cannot breastfeed the baby prior to going to work and eat her breakfast at the same time. Because every time her spoon hits the plate, the baby disengages. And the only thing we could relate it back to was this tapping at the bot back of a bottle. Babies can commence small feeds from 34 to 35 weeks, providing this, they are sleeping deeply and they are hemodynamically stable. And they are moving through their sleep states normally. You cannot just take a baby because it's 34 weeks and it's ill and now you want to feed it. It must, it must be fed properly. Chronic lung disease babies must rather feed small feeds more regularly, i.e. rather feed them small feeds every three hours and continue their tube feeding till their reserve improves. The baby needs to be supported to feed and not fed to feed. You need to think of it mindfully. There's the reading. So what I am now quickly going to discuss with you is a few issues that occur long term when I see these babies at a developmental clinic that are problematic. Firstly, if a baby has been kept nil per os or um, basically starved because of NEC, those babies very often later on actually don't get the sensation they feel and they tend to overfeed and that can be problematic and they will present with overfeeding. The second problem that very often arises that um, very often you guys um, tend to say to me, um, this baby is refluxing. Well, firstly, any baby that's got a nasogastric tube in will reflux. Orogastric tube, it will reflux because the sphincter cannot close. But who actually suffers from reflux? Middle-aged men and women with large abdomens. Why? Because they don't have core development. Now, if you think of the pregnancy at the end of pregnancy, the uterus stops growing at about 32 weeks. And then what happens is the baby gets larger and it gets folded in on itself. So I'm going to ask you to do the following. Just bring your knees as you're sitting up towards your um, abdomen and move forward. And you should feel that you're engaging your abdominal muscles. A baby that's laying unswaddled, unflexed in a neonatal unit on its back is not developing core. If you do not have core, you cannot control the reflux. So making sure a baby is swaddled and flexed will allow for better core development. And Core development helps. So very often babies are discharged from your neonatal unit, but nobody tells the mother that the baby needs to do tummy time. How do you continue developing core? You do tummy time with the baby at home as soon as possible. Very often, if you have a mother of short stature, under 1.6, Oh, centimeters, which I think is about five foot three. 
if the mother is that small, you will tend to see that in about month three and four post-discharge, these babies start to fluid limit. And why do they fluid limit? We don't know. But we have to watch them because they do fluid limit. And they often then battle to weight gain. And it is because they actually cannot take in more fluid. But having said that, babies who've had repeated suctioning and repeated things happen to them very often present later on with an oral aversion. And they battle to actually take to solids properly and to finish their bottle. It is very important that you are aware of these problems. Are there any questions? Yes, Linda, thank you very much. Um, we have received a few questions already. So what we're going to do now, we're going to address the next batch of questions. So if you do have any questions, please type them in. And after this, we will continue with the um, demonstration on some of the family integration care that we can provide from the Drager site. So um, thank you, Linda, for this excellent presentation. I think today was um, the content was quite interesting, yet quite controversial. And um, I think we still um, have to battle for the, uh, uh, you know, for the for, to have the possibility to breastfeed our babies in the NICUs. So thank you again for your insight on this topic. Um, we have now a few questions already. So um, um, basically, the first question: What about the babies born with the um, ascites? When can we introduce the colostrum to those babies? With the side teeth, so they've got they are uh, hydrops fetalis. I would do the colostrum as soon as possible because if they've got a side teeth, they will have very low albumin. And remembering that colostrum is high in albumin, so as soon as you possibly can. If we're talking gastroschisis, those babies, um, the ones with the intestines on the outside. They often go from, um, from the delivery suite straight to um, theater and then come back to the ward. They will be kept nil per mouth from the surgeon's point of view and feeding will be on the surgeon's advice. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, the next question. Um, when feeding, when feeding the baby and the baby falls asleep, what should you do, especially if the baby has been prescribed a volume of feed to be given? This is very controversial. And, um, you know, I, I do not think that we should wake them up. Um, sleep is essential. The only time a brain can assimilate any form of learning and sucking is a form of learning um, is when the baby sleeps if the baby goes to sleep rather than tube feed it if they are talking about volume and the tubes being removed then you've got to go back and look and this often is a mistake made when you discharge a baby from intensive care and you tell the mum you must feed three hourly, you must feed three hourly. If you keep waking a, a baby up in a deep sleep phase, you cause again a pathway problem. And my experience has taught me that actually leave the baby to sleep, rather tube feed it then if you're in the intensive care, and let the baby sleep and wake naturally and signal to you that they are hungry. And then feed the baby and see what happens. But very often, we are chasing a volume that the baby cannot feed to, and they do go to sleep. Excellent. Thank you, Linda, for this uh, feedback. So 
The next question, um, in our NICU, the babies remain on their back until discharge to the um, high dependency unit. While there, apart from swaddling, how else can we help the baby have core development when they're still inside the incubator? So the use of nests are for exactly that reason, is that you can place them and flex them slightly. So positioning would be very, very important. You can slightly lift them and tuck a small blanket under their, their, their buttock so that they more in a flexion position. And then when you are actually working with the baby, just changing its position and, and, and helping it um, while you are working with it can help um, for, for, the, um, for the actual um, core development. Um, there are sets of exercises which have been developed, which um, you can get from me if you, if you drop me an email that I can sh um, send you um, a short video and you can try and do those as well um, if, if that is what's happening. But it is important that we do put babies to sideline. So the, um, it is suggested also that it helps with the um, brain perfusion. So they do not have to lie on their backs. They should actually also be considered to put on their sides. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Do you suggest to start bottle feeding only at 34 weeks? So the brain actually hasn't got sufficient um, pathway and maturity before 34 weeks. You can cup feed, and if you're very skilled at that, you'll be able to do that. But the brain actually cannot do it completely correctly and if that pathway it's it's not feeding correctly and you're now trying to bottle and please do not think that I think bottle feeding is better than breastfeeding there, there is a far better reason to put a baby to a breast under 34 weeks than trying a bottle very often a uh, uh, preemie at 32 weeks will nuzzle and suck at the breast and be able to take some nourishment. Remembering that um, when a mother is using a breast pump or hand expressing, she will only get four milk. There will be very little hind milk. Even though she empties her breast or she thinks she empties her breast, that is nourishing. It is essential, and I know Margarita is going to cover how the baby can go skin to skin now from the incubator. At 32 weeks, the babies can, even before that, they, they are documented to nuzzle and lick at the breast. A, it improves breast milk production. B, they get breast milk, and for them, it is... I don't subscribe to this. It's easier to feed a bottle versus a nipple. I've seen many babies take to a nipple far easier than to a bottle. So, you know, there's no reason why they can't be put on the nipple earlier than that. But the actual bottle feeding is, is um, you should really only look at it at about 34 weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Linda, for this insight. Um, we have very positive feedback of participants already. Um, and if you don't have any more questions, what I would like to do now is to demonstrate how we, from the um, supplier or from the device perspective, can support the family integration and the support of kangaroo care and potentially even breastfeeding. So um, I'm going to do a short product demonstration now and then we will open the floor again for, the, for your questions. So I am just going to quickly set up. And one second. In the meantime, if you do get any questions, you can 
always reach out to us and uh, reach out to Linda and let us know if there is any further topics that you would like to focus on in the future. Okay, so what I would like to demonstrate today is how we can optimize and how we can support the family integration and the practice of the kangaroo care. I know that a lot of facilities are um, trying to offer at least a, 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 a special environment where the, the mother and the child can create bonds. However, in a lot of cases, this environment sometimes can be noisy or they can be disturbed by the alarms that are coming from the incubator. That's why in our incubator, so in this case, we have a baby Leo TN500. And also in our Isolate 8000 Plus, we have a functionality that is called a kangaroo care. So the kangaroo care basically supports the process of building the bond between the mom and the child and supporting the kangaroo process. But before we start with the kangaroo, we can actually optimize the setup of the incubator. The biggest challenge is that in a lot of cases, premature birth is unexpected and mothers sometimes end up going through a cesarean section and um, it's very difficult for them to be in the standing position or to, 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 stay, to stay next to the incubator over a longer period of time. So what happens in a lot of cases, our incubator is usually set up for the height of the nurse to easy access to the baby. So I'm just setting up the device now. So let's say usually for my height, I would imagine that the incubator um, would be of this height. So as a nurse, I can easily access to my baby. But if we, have, uh, if we are to imagine a mother who are uh, basically trying to uh, start with the kangaroo hair. This might be too high. She can clearly see the baby, but it's not that easy to access to the baby. So what we can do and what we, what we allow with the baby layer, we can position the device in the lowest position. And the lowest position, even if it's suitable for the mothers and comfortable for the mothers, that are still in the wheelchair after, for example, an emergency C-section. So now we are in the lowest position and um, in the design of the incubator, and I can show you from the side, in the design of the incubator, we have a special uh, compartment for the knees to easy position and to sit very close to the device. So basically as a mom, I can engage with my baby while still being seated. So this makes the process already a little bit easier. Furthermore, as I was mentioning, we also have the uh, so-called kangaroo care functionality. So, and the kangaroo care functionality is um, basically allowing or uh, uh, allowing the, the, the mother to build the bonds with the child without being disturbed by the nuisance alarms. Uh, so what we see in the operation of the device, we of course have the skin mode, we have the air mode, and we have the kangaroo mode. When we activate the kangaroo mode, what we see, first of all, we see the duration of the kangaroo. So this uh, is noted and this is noted in the system setup so we can always observe how much time the baby has spent in the kangaroo care. Also, uh, we are um, uh, what happens during the kangaroo care, the nuisance alarms are disabled. So uh, basically, there are no um, alarms that are unnecessary. Okay. 
for the kangaroo care, we also have special alarms. So we have the alarm limits, especially for kangaroo modes. So we can uh, remove the upper limit alarm and only have the lower limit alarm. And we know that during the kangaroo care, uh, the research of proven, and there are multiple papers that show that uh, mom provides a better thermal regulation source than the incubator even, and the mom is able to help the baby to um, thermal regulate while being uh, in skin to skin contact. That's why we can now set special alarms for the kangaroo mode, and we can also set the deviation between the set temperature and the measured temperature in order to avoid the unnecessary alarms during the kangaroo care. Um, of course, we uh, during the kangaroo care, what else is important is that when we take the baby out of the incubator, what happens is normally cold air gets into the incubator and the environment in the incubator is being affected by the um, uh, outside temperature. In order to avoid that, and in order to offer a neutral, uh, thermal neutral environment, during kangaroo care, when we open uh, the side port to uh, take the baby for the skin to skin contact, and when we close the sidewalk of the incubator, the incubator will maintain the same temperature throughout the entire procedure. So what it means is that um, the, um, the, 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 the temperature inside the incubator is maintained during the entire kangaroo care. So when the baby is returned to the incubator, the baby is returned to the same humidity settings, to the same temperature settings, and to the same oxygen settings. This is very important for the continuity of the therapy during the kangaroo care. We want to avoid potential risk of the cold stress or the heat stress that is associated with the um, transfer from the incubator into the outside environment. That's why um, it is very important to maintain the same temperature inside the incubator compartment so that when the baby returns from skin to skin um, uh, procedure, from skin to skin care, the baby returns to the same environment in the incubator. And um, this is basically supporting the mothers in the, uh, uh, in the NICU to perform the, uh, to, to build bonds and to uh, perform the skin to skin care. And I think Linda has highlighted that it is absolutely uh, essential uh, for, to start early breastfeeding. Uh, Linda has shared the importance of the uh, colostrum and the uh, early feeding. And I think having the device in the NICU that allows, um, that allows for this procedure to take place um, is very helpful both for the mother but also for the nursing of the uh, hospital. So, um, and of course, the information about the kangaroo care is stored in the device. So this information can be transferred and can be exported into the data file in case if there is uh, a need for the follow-up of the procedure. So once again, it's quite simple to set up. Uh, we can be in the skin mode or we can be in the air mode. We just activate the kangaroo mode and what happens, we have the duration of the kangaroo. We maintain the same environment inside the incubator and uh, we now can take the baby out of the incubator and we can uh, continue with the skin to skin care. Similar setup, so this is in the baby layer, similar procedure we have in the isolate 8000 plus. 
that supports also the kangaroo care. And um, from our observation in the media, this is very helpful and this is extremely encouraging for the, for the moms uh, to, uh, to perform kangaroo care. Also, in order to um, not, just not to disturb uh, a new mom with the kangaroo care, we can activate the family view. So we remove the complexity of the parameters from the screen and we only maintain the key parameters. So we have the name and we have the information about the temperature, the current temperatures of the babies. So this is again to reduce the anxiety and potential fear of the new moms uh, during the interaction with their babies. So they can really focus on building the bonds, on breastfeeding and on uh, doing the skin to skin care. So this is um, basically a short technology insight that I wanted to share with you when it comes to the kangaroo uh, care and to the family integration in the NICU. So now I would be happy to open the floor for further questions and um, see if you have so there does seem to be um, a few additional questions. Um, the first question is, how can we involve the parents in kangaroo care for babies who have been intubated for prolonged periods of time? I think, Linda, your perspective on this would be very beneficial since you are actively working in the NICU. So maybe you can share your experience on how you engage parents into the uh, kangaroo care. So there's no reason why um, the stable ventilated baby can't go skin to skin or kangaroo care. It is just a nurse's ability to move the baby. If you've ensured that the, the um, ET tube is freshly strapped. If the lines and everything that is there is a spaghetti is moved correctly and you have help of colleagues, you can put a baby skin to skin on a mum. They are so scared at that stage that they will sit there like little marble soldiers, not move and the babies will be fine. Remember that when we do start skin to skin or KMC, there's a period by which baby and mommy adjust. So the minute you put the baby on mommy and the, the mommy has the baby, they both, they will both have a tachycardia. They will both be a little bit unsettled. But then as mom breathes and baby breathes with mom, what we find is that they both settle down and it's very likely that in that position, then the baby will go to sleep. Also, just on that, because the baby is then on the chest, it will flex naturally, um, and that allows for it. Um, if they've, they've been extubated, but you want to stimulate um, KMC, what it is showing, and I can't seem to find the article, but I will look for it again, is that in babies where we have had small bleeds, so grade one in intraventricular hemorrhage, if those mothers can do kangaroo care for up to three hours a day, there's a massive improvement in the developmental care and it almost acts as brain sparing or neuroprotective for those babies. One just needs to really encourage parents not to be scared. And very often when they start seeing another mother do it and they see that everything goes well, invariably they will trial it. It's, it's just getting them to understand how important it is. It's exceptionally important because all babies are born in their sensory phase. All mammals are born in their sensory phase. So... If you look at a baby elephant or a baby whale or a baby deer, 
all of them within 30 minutes can run and save their own lives. The human can't do that. They have to carry their baby at least till nine or 10 months when their child learns to walk. And for that reason, um, for that flight and fright of the mammal, babies are born in their sensory developmentary phase. And so that skin to skin is essential because other than sight, their skin and smell helps them orientate and calms them down. So they need that warm skin. They need that smell of mom's. If you are, and it sounds like this person is really wanting to get um, KMC off the ground, one of the most important things is to tell mom and your staff that you need to use the same product over and over and over again. Do not use perfume because they need to smell your, your skin. So I always suggest that they use something soft like Nivea, or one of the soft bath products, and they really, they, they can wear deodorant, but nothing more than that when they come to do it, so that the baby can smell the skin. Because if you do um, KMC often enough, um, feeding is much easier than in babies where KMC hasn't been done. Excellent. Thank you, Linda, so much for this perspective. And um, I can add from our side that um, we've seen it quite often that even intubated babies can be uh, comfortably positioned onto the mother or father um, for the kangaroo care. And the, ob obviously, uh, it is important to stabilize the baby prior to taking him out uh, of the incubator. But even for prolonged ventilated babies, the advantages of skin-to-skin -skin care are tremendous. So far, we have not had any further questions. Yes, so that was our last question. Um, I'm going to keep the floor open for the questions for a little bit longer. Um, to ensure that we have addressed all of your questions. And in the meantime, if you have missed the previous modules, please visit our website that um, the link has been posted in the chat box uh, in order to receive the recordings of the past webinars. We have covered many very interesting topics starting from resuscitation and the golden hour and going into the transport, uh, the cardiovascular system of the babies, the respiratory system of the babies. Um, and um, yeah, the webinars are available for downloads. The presentations are available for downloads. So please refer to our website. And also we will, we will be having three more modules in the upcoming months um, to cover the further topics such as uh, renal system, the uh, uh, endocrine system, and the neurological system. You can also register for the upcoming webinars on our website. And with this, since we don't have any further questions, I would like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar. I hope it was useful for you and we are looking forward to welcoming you again. I would like to thank you, Linda, for your, again, great experiences and um, sharing with us your expertise. I think it's extremely valuable that you're, you're joining us on the, in, during this educational Horses. Um, um, Marguerite, so can, can we can we just mention the 18th of November when we've got our International Premier Day, which will be open for people to attend, and that the basis of that day will be resuscitation, COVID in the NICU, and um, a lot of emphasis on developmental care, what happens to the babies, 
after they leave your unit, what problems can we expect and how do we deal with them? Thank you, Linda, for reminding me. Yes, we will be um, having the um, inf uh, webinar or an educational session around the World Prematurity Day on the November 18th. And uh, the information about the uh, webinar will soon be published on our website. And for those of you who have already registered, so for all of you, we, you will be receiving a special email with the information on how to register for the webinar. And um, I think this webinar is quite important because we're going to have um, uh, many international speakers and speakers from South Africa talking about the challenges of um, COVID-19 and the impact of the COVID-19 for the NICU population and for the NICU staff and also um, um, sharing some of the case studies. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for being part of our um, webinar today. I hope you enjoyed the session. The webinar has been recorded, and the recording will be available shortly uh, for, for downloads and for uh, on YouTube as well. And you will be receiving uh, an information one, once this is available. Um, all right, so if there are no more questions, once again, I would like to thank you all for participation and I hope to see you all in the future upcoming sessions. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.